Since 1987, the UK P&I Club has been tracking incidents that threaten owners' profits, putting jobs and lives at risk. The club's annual analysis of major claims shows that collisions, pollution, damage to property and personal injuries all take a serious toll. But most expensive of all are cargo claims, accounting for one in four insurance payouts. Human error plays a part in at least seven in ten claims. The way the industry is changing, the club believes this situation will get worse, unless action is taken. The first in a series, this video is an introduction to cargo loss prevention. Other videos focus on specific trades. A book is available from the club or the Nautical Institute. The club has taken these initiatives, believing that owners, charterers, traders and ships officers could all benefit from a more open approach to the carriage and care of cargoes. Once, most shipping companies owned their own vessels and employed their own seafarers. A man might serve for many years in the same trade, gathering experience of his ship, her owner, crew, ports of call, and the cargo she carried. For most mariners, things are very different today. A master whose experience is mainly carrying timber and bauxite in the North Atlantic might well be called to Africa to take command of a vessel carrying rice. He'll probably sail within hours of his first sight of the ship. There won't be time to get to know the other officers. The mate may have no experience of this type of trade or even this type of vessel before this voyage. It could be two years since the second mate last went to sea, and then on supply vessels. The booster pumps uh, for the main engine. Commercial pressures okay, mean thanks. crews which are smaller, often less well trained, and of mixed nationality are here to stay. So are problems like fatigue, language and cultural differences, the enemies of efficiency. Even knowing who you're reporting to can no longer be taken for granted. Unraveling the contractual ties binding owners, operators, shippers, charterers, traders, crewing agents and the rest could be a full-time job. As traditional ways of doing business are replaced by a mosaic of remote relationships, masters and mates will find themselves changing trades and cargoes more often they will have to change too. So if you can just Learning how to handle many kinds of cargo at short uh, notice is very different from slowly gathering expertise in one. One thing hasn't changed. The ship's operator is in business to earn a profit from the safe transportation of cargo. Doing so provides jobs for hundreds of thousands of shipping company employees worldwide and millions more in the many other parties to every movement of cargo. Thanks to their cooperation, the great majority of cargo movements are accomplished successfully. It's when things go wrong that it becomes clear the interests of shippers, receivers, cargo handlers, charterers and ship owners are not the same. While two holds passed on first inspection, a charter party let the charterer hold a ship off hire until all five were ready.
On another vessel, hard-frozen squid was ruined when stevedores refused to load frozen orange juice until the hold was raised to minus 10 degrees. The receiver sued the ship owner for $400,000. A charterer insisted on loading steel in the rain. But when it rusted, the English High Court found the ship owner responsible. This lesson in law cost him $1.7 million. Since the buck often stops with owners, it's vital that ship's personnel are mindful of their rights and responsibilities. These are set out in agreements such as charter parties and bills of lading, which incorporate provisions of national maritime law and international conventions. The most recent convention on the carriage of goods by sea, the 1978 Hamburg Rules, makes the carrier liable for cargo damage unless he proves that he took all reasonable measures to avoid the loss. These rules have been adopted by few countries outside Africa, but where they do apply, they require careful examination. Much more relevant for most voyages are conventions known as the Hague and Hague-Visby rules, both very widely adopted. The Hague and Hague-Visby rules provide the carrier with specific defences and the possibility of limiting his liability. In exchange, they impose considerable responsibilities on him. The carrier must exercise due diligence to make the ship seaworthy, properly man, equip and supply her, and make her cargo worthy. While the Hague and Hague-Visby rules grant the carrier specific defences, they leave him in no doubt about how he's expected to carry out his responsibilities. The carrier shall properly and carefully load, handle, stow, carry, keep, care for and discharge the goods carried. By highlighting ways of preventing loss or damage during each stage of cargo operations, this video aims to help masters and crews carry out those responsibilities. Although passengers can bring welcome relief from the pressures of port, there's usually plenty to do to maintain the ship in seaworthy condition. By seaworthy, the Hague rules mean hull machinery, cargo spaces, equipment and crew must all perform properly so that the ship can go to sea without risk to itself or to the cargo. If a claim arises from a defect which a careful inspection before the voyage would have revealed, the ship owner is almost certain to end up paying. An improperly fastened tank top manhole cover allowed fuel oil to damage a cargo of bagged rice. Similar incidents involving ballast water are common. Faulty lashing gear led to the loss of 15 containers overboard damage to five more and a settlement exceeding $700,000. Failure of a tanker's cargo pump halted discharge for 10 days while oil prices fell. It cost the owner three quarters of a million dollars. Engine and generator problems caused by poor maintenance led to a reefer vessel having to abandon her voyage and paying two and a half million dollars to cargo interests. To avoid accusations of unseaworthiness, all systems must be maintained in good order, including cargo handling systems, hatch covers, access to cargo spaces and lighting, bilge pumps and wells, 
and sounding pipes, sensors and air vents. Faults must be rectified as soon as possible by the crew or by specialists at the next port if necessary. Procedures should be followed properly. Rain damaged 10 tonnes of grain when a series of mishaps meant a crew took seven hours to close a hatch while discharging. Small amounts of leftover cargo can cause big problems. Traces of barley led to New Zealand's health authorities refusing to clear a cargo of fertiliser. Contamination cost the owner one and a half million dollars. When a different cargo is carried, it's unwise to guess how clean cargo spaces must be. Much safer to ask for instructions. Don't miss the opportunity to examine for structural defects. When bolts that had failed were ignored, part of a bulk carrier's hold lining was discharged with the cargo. It caused $44,000 worth of damage to a conveyor. Steam leaking from a fuel tank heating coil caused damage to bulk grain, which cost $100,000. Commercial success dictates that time in port should be kept to a minimum. Good commercial preparation is as important as good navigational preparation. Let's have a play arrival meeting for Rotterdam. Free arrival meetings let all concerned know what to expect and what their own responsibilities will be. Tonight, 2030s, we will arrive at Mars River Pilot Station. The master should explain any special requirements contained in the charter party or voyage instructions. The first mate should explain any peculiarities of the cargo's loading, carriage and discharge. Disconnect monitoring code uh, before uh, arrive, arrival at Rotterdam. If more than one cargo is to be carried, are they compatible or must they be separated? Dangerous cargo on deck. We have about one point quarter. Yes. Which is a uh, dangerous cargo and uh, nine. Uh, 1.4 mostly in uh, old 24 on deck. In the bulk trades, the first mate will have carefully considered the maximum load limits in each cargo space when planning the stow. This will remind the junior officers of the risk of overloading the ship's structure if the cargo is not stowed according to the pre-plan. But no one knows everything about the carriage of cargo. If contributions are encouraged, the pre-arrival meeting is an opportunity for everyone to learn. Before arriving in the loading port, remember, do everything possible to keep the ship seaworthy. Be certain how clean cargo spaces should be and check for structural defects. Convene a pre-arrival meeting so everyone knows exactly what to do. Oh, John, I'd have a little more weight in the tween deck. This ship is getting as stiff as blazes. We haven't got rubber holes, you know. They won't stretch. Wish they would sometimes. You can't push these things around with your little finger, you know. You've got to get your crowbar going. Docks are notoriously difficult to secure. No matter how well guarded the entrance, the back door is always open. 
If officers relax their vigilance, cargo theft will increase. But even when this seems unlikely, security is still vital. What your business? I came for Stevie though. Stowaways are not the only threat to a ship's commercial well-being. Remember, the ship owner's interests are not necessarily the same as the charterers, shippers, receivers or cargo handlers. Access to the ship should be denied to unauthorised persons. If crew are overextended, employ security personnel if necessary. Try them. I want to go inside and take my file. What want identity? What want to do? What rule and regulation do you make a fee? Get it. What want to do? Hatches should be closed and doors locked when not in use. Visitors must not be allowed to wander round the ship, take photographs or talk to the crew without permission from the master. It's my usual practice to tell the chief officer. A senior officer should accompany surveyors, but if the demands of arrival make this impossible, a junior substitute must be adequately briefed. Surveyors taking photographs for other parties should be accompanied by a surveyor acting for the ship owner to guard against distortion. Documents must never be signed without thought, however persuasive the argument. Second mate. I believe the chief mate's turned in at the moment getting some sleep. I've delivered the paint, it's all up forward, and it's all exactly according to the receipts. So all I need now is you to sign... Them Only sign if you know you are authorised to do so. But the bosun's already checked it. If you don't understand the document or don't know for sure that what it says is right, don't hesitate to say no. OK, there's still no possible thing Oh, yes, sir. I was sent for you to sign these papers stating that you would not open your hatch doors. So allow the ship Letters to go. of protest no, should always be taken seriously. Ignoring vague protests by receivers of steel in Libya led to a ship's arrest a year later. Uh, they said to say that you need to acknowledge that you would not open your doors. No, I sign them for Sign them for receipt only and forward them to the owner without delay. Receipts for cargo must never be signed until it's on board. One in five high-value cargo claims is for deterioration caused by poor handling or poor stowage. The traditional advice to new officers is to imagine that the cargo is their own property. Sounds simple enough, but what does it involve today? Arranging duty rotors to avoid overwork, fatigue and mistakes. If stevedores would be working on board, knowing how many gangs and the details of shift changes and breaks. Appreciating that in some ports only stevedores are allowed to handle ship's gear and breaking this rule can be costly. Where shore-based equipment is used, knowing how it works and how to communicate with the operators. Being aware of its limitations with particular regard to movements of the ship. Being certain of the draft limits at the berth or checking them. Being familiar with any stability computer used on board. Understanding that straying from cargo and ballast plans can endanger the ship. Appreciating that the maximum limits for shear forces and bending moments were calculated for the ship in new condition. This means being alert to the causes of damage or decay that weaken the ship and looking out for any unexpected lists and trims. On arrival in the loading port, remember, secure the ship against theft, restrict access, escort visitors, think before you sign,
Do you understand it? Are you authorised? Sign letters of protest for receipt only and forward them to the owner. Oversee the activities of stevedores. Consider the consequences before changing cargo or ballast plans. One in ten high-value claims arises from damage which occurs before loading begins. Great savings could be made if officers carried out a pre-shipment inspection whenever possible. It's accepted that they can't be experts on every cargo, but it's expected that cargo officers note any obvious defects to establish whether the cargo is in apparent good order and condition. A tanker may not have the facilities to confirm that a crude oil is Arabian light, but a sample full of water requires immediate action. A container with a broken seal always needs investigating. It may be impossible to confirm that steel is grade B, but you can see if it's rusty or deformed. In some trades, pre-shipment surveys are routine, but these may only protect the interests of the shipper or charterer unless the ship owner has arranged his own survey. The master may not be able to carry out a pre-shipment survey himself, but he still has a duty to declare the condition of the cargo when it's received on board. When the cargo's condition is not as described in the bill of lading, there are two options. Reject it or clause the bill. In theory. But cargoes are often bought and sold by means of documentary credits. A banking system which rejects clause bills because it can't value them. And they're reported to have taken, paid a million dollars for 60,000 gas on when the condition of the cargo is such that the bill of lading should be clausd, a letter of indemnity is sometimes offered instead. Masters should remember that such letters may be entirely worthless if the person giving them is later unwilling to pay. Courts have even taken the view that accepting an indemnity constitutes collusion between shipper and carrier to defraud the consignee. practice, the objective must be to load a cargo that fairly matches the description on the bill of lading. Ships personnel have a legal duty to take care of the goods in their custody. They must ensure the condition of the goods is not impaired by poor handling, poor stowage or adverse weather. Rain often flushes out conflicting interests. Over to you. Fine, thank you very much. Right, the, it actually hasn't rained. It hasn't rained for the last two hours, so we'd like to open the hatches and, and get on with the job. You should arrange the workers according to the weather condition. It states here quite clearly that you have no... Shippers uh, wishing a master to continue loading may offer an indemnity for any damage caused to cargo or ship. The, uh, the job, sir. We've actually loaded hundreds of times with this letter. Whatever the commercial demands and customs of the trade may be, it's unwise to rely on such a letter. If the shipper is later unwilling or unable to honour it, the letter will be worthless. The little bit of rain that we have, I don't see any problem why we come, can't come to some amicable arrangement that we can actually get loaded and get you on your way, sir. It's raining. You should stop. You must stop. So, I don't accept any party seen causing damage to cargo must be made accountable. 
Even if it's a stevedore or shore operator who mishandles the cargo, the ship owner will be the target of any claim. To protect the ship owner, report all damage and issue a letter of protest to those responsible. When checking cargo condition, remember. Inspect the cargo before loading if possible. Record obvious defects. Report damage and issue letters of protest to those responsible. Don't rely on letters of indemnity. The CC? Yes, she's taking 9,000 tonne of coal for Italy. The carrier is also responsible for delivering the quantity of cargo stated in the bill of lading. He may face a claim for shortage if the figure discharge is less, even if all the cargo loaded is delivered. Claims for shortage arise for a variety of reasons. Discharging at the wrong port could be prevented by better planning and better supervision of stevedores. Theft on board can be reduced by security. Arranging for a surveyor to seal the holds helps defend against claims for short delivery. Water draining from bulk cargoes can leach away ship owners' profits unless carefully measured and recorded. Many claims result simply because the quantity of cargo loaded wasn't known in the first place. Whether by tallying, measuring, weighing or draft survey, it's essential that the quantity of cargo loaded and discharged is accurately recorded. If the figure stated by the shipper is incorrect and the quantity actually loaded is known, the mate's receipt and subsequently the bill of lading must be claused to show the real quantity. If the master can't check the quantity or believes it may be wrong, the Hague rules let him protect his interests by using appropriate clauses. Said to contain Shippers load and count. Weight, quantity and quality unknown. When the freight is based on declared weight, it's not unknown for shippers to under-declare, which can damage or endanger the ship if not detected. The quantity of cargo loaded or discharged is often obtained from measurements made ashore. The accuracy of these can never be taken for granted. Standards vary from terminal to terminal throughout the world. Be careful, we sell the cats when they brought you in. It's in the ship's interests always to make its own measurements whenever possible. 23 is good. Okay. 2,000 number 5, 3,000 number 3. Anticipating disagreements between ship and shore figures, many owners have a set procedure to follow. This often requires masters to contact the owner if the cargo shortage exceeds a specified limit. A procedure established in advance can save time getting the ship moving and earning money again. To establish cargo quantity, remember, keep security tight.
tally accurately. Make your own measurements. Consider sealing holds. Ensure mate's receipts and bills of lading show the actual quantity loaded or are properly claused. Know in advance what the owner wants to do if ship and shore figures disagree. Good evening, my excavator, my bull. All well, no trouble, no trouble at all, sir. Come on, Bill. When the pressure is on to leave the berth. Paperwork sometimes takes second place. Excuse me, sir. Uh, five minutes before we train it. Oh! But okay. arriving with incomplete cargo documents has cost up to a million dollars and a crew detained for a year. Time taken now to ensure correct stowage, lashing, and stability can save money and lives later. Hatch covers and tank lids require special attention. If seawater leaks through any cover in poor condition, the ship is held to be unseaworthy, and the owner's lack of due diligence will mean he's liable for the consequences. When this happens, the club investigates the ship's maintenance regime and the condition of its hatch covers. It may require repairs before continuing the owner's insurance. Water damage from below is not uncommon. The best defense is regular sounding of the bilges and always recording what you've found. Instructions for the carriage of cargo, such as heating, cooling or ventilating, should be followed as closely as possible. Actions taken should be carefully logged. Sometimes it's just not possible to carry out instructions, such as ventilating in conditions like this. If you can't, the reason must be logged and charterers told without delay. If you have to reduce speed or change course, the reasons should again be spelled out. Whatever voyage instructions may say, it's the master who's responsible for bringing ship, crew and cargo safely to the berth. On the loaded voyage, remember, poor stowage, poor lashing and hatch cover faults cause most claims. Sound bilges regularly. Follow carriage instructions. Maintain appropriate temperatures and ventilate when necessary. Log weather and sea conditions and changes to planned course and speed. Don't forget, the master has the last word whenever safety is concerned. Matches over the side to Gilead's craft. Then briskets to land. Right. Number three all. One gap. The cargo has arrived, but unfortunately the bill of lading hasn't. The receiver's agent claims it's stuck in the banking system. The master is aware that releasing the cargo in the absence of a bill of lading could forfeit the owner's P&I cover. What should he do? The master doesn't want to miss the tide. 
and knows that holding up the stevedores will cost money. Charter parties sometimes contain an agreement that the charterer will indemnify the owner if he faces a claim for delivering the cargo to the wrong person. The master has alerted the owner and telephoned the charterer for instructions. And, uh, Until he receives them, everyone must keep sure cool. That. Captain, why don't you start discharging the cargo now to avoid any further delay? I must await uh, charterer's instruction. Even when the charterer gives the go-ahead, uh, the master is cautious. To, uh, I have to receive a uh, written instruction uh, to discharge this cargo from here. Yes. Directions should always be in writing. But you know, it's, I have a fax on board uh, and you know the number. I will wait. Uh, One owner who accepted his charterer's telephoned instructions to discharge well, was subsequently sued uh, by him for three million dollars. As soon as uh, fax uh, received, uh, we can get a uh, recharge cargo. I would be grateful, Captain. The quantity of cargo discharged must be recorded as accurately as when loading. In bulk trades, it's good practice to obtain an empty hold or dry tank certificate, preferably signed by the receiver. At the very least, the master should log the fact that the hold or tank is empty. Cargo damage discovered at the discharge port must also be carefully noted. This helps defend the ship owner against any exaggerated claims that may result. It's essential for the master to arrange for a P&I club surveyor to assess the amount of the damage and advise on the best way to minimize any claims. Prompt action must be taken to identify the cause of the damage and stop it happening again. Good communication between ship and stevedore helps prevent damage to cargo after discharging. This is not strictly the ship's liability, but in case it's later claimed that the ship was responsible, it's good practice to note any problems. On arrival at the discharge port, remember, demand original bills of lading before discharging cargo. If an original bill is not produced, contact the ship owner. If you can, establish the quantity of cargo discharged as carefully as when loading. Record any cargo damage and ask a club correspondent to call in a surveyor. Note any circumstances after discharging that could lead to a claim against the ship. Taking cargo right up to the last miserable minute. Oh, well, you're in the transport business, mister, and the transport business is keeping things moving. Another cargo safely discharged. Another piece of business successfully concluded. But there's no room for complacency. Remember, human error plays a part in at least seven out of ten major claims. Loading a reefer container into a slot where it was kept at 10 degrees instead of minus 18 cost $20,000. Relying solely on the charterer's tally of cotton bales left a ship defenseless against a $25,000 shortage claim. A vessel infringing US ballast salinity rules in the Great Lakes was held off hire while returning nearly a thousand miles to sea to re-ballast. Hatch cover leaks caused damage to wheat worth one and a half million dollars. Replacement packing and spares were on board but not used.
When things go wrong, knowing your rights is not enough. You must be able to prove that you've carried out your responsibilities. That's why commercial records should be kept as carefully as navigation records. Accurate time recording of each log entry is essential to enable the master to check the agent's statement of facts before sailing. Any stoppages to cargo operations or reductions in pumping rates must be accurately timed and their reasons recorded. Metric tons on board. Sort out any discrepancies with the stevedore or shore operator at the time, not when the ship is about to sail. If a dispute can't be resolved, issue a letter of protest. It's good practice to log the weather every four hours. In any event, the start and end of rainfall should be recorded to keep track of weather working days. Good records make good business sense. They also make good evidence. Nowadays, it seems there's no such thing as an accident. Somebody is always to blame. It's not just the cost of the cargo, but the cost of the legal battle that can turn a minor incident into a major claim. When good evidence is available, a claim can be resolved quickly and more cheaply. If it goes to court, judges place great weight on good documentation from the vessel. It's always better to write too much than too little, provided you stick to facts and observations. Opinion and speculation must never be recorded. In some ports and on some types of vessel, all forms of photography are prohibited. But where permitted, photos and videos can be valuable additions to written evidence, particularly if they have a date-time reference. Like any evidence, they'll be available to all parties to a dispute, so they may reveal any deficiencies on board. Land's End and set off across the Atlantic. You had a very... If a claim occurs, it'll be difficult to recall what happened by the time you're required to give evidence. Was that the only day when you had bad weather during the voyage? Yes, that would seem to be the only day, uh, as far as I can recollect. And, of course, the log, mm. fair log, uh, evidence is it. For example, on the 11th of April... Your records will probably be all you have to refresh your memory and should be written with this in mind. Write in ink, avoid erasures, and initial any corrections. Yes, so the, the original, the scrap log, is that still on board the vessel? Well, the scrap log book is usually returned to the owner's office and then it's destroyed or thrown away because it's a small office and we don't have sufficient storage space. Don't throw away scrap logs or rough notebooks or reports made after incidents. In law, original records are more valuable than those subsequently composed. And never be tempted to improve a case by altering records. The 11th of April, all of these other vessels are reporting light winds, calm seas. And it seems to me that it would be impossible for you to have experienced this sort of weather on that day when all of these other ships, which are within your immediate vicinity and are totally independent, are reporting different weather. It's many months now, you must understand. You know, I've Faking is easily detected by expert investigators. This makes matters worse and brings officers and owners into disrepute. Met office. Now, there must be some mistake somewhere. Somebody's got the dates wrong. So if you can just put one into Ship's personnel who understand the international cargo rules and are aware of relevant specific agreements between ship owner and charterer are better equipped to avoid claims. Other resources will already be on board. Most ship operators provide manuals setting out procedures to cover many operations, including cargo. Master's standing orders and first mate's instructions can supplement company instructions. Then there are publications from the IMO. 
the Nautical Institute, and commercial publishers. UK P&I Club publications and videos are available free of charge to all members. Because human error is the cause of most claims, it pays to think ahead. Make records of your actions carefully. They may become evidence. Photos and videos are good evidence too. Don't destroy rough records, even when fair copies are made. Remember, faking is easily detected. Use all available resources to help you carry out your responsibilities. With its London agent and correspondence in every major port, the UK P&I Club can provide expert help wherever and whenever you need it. This is a small hole that costs the lake. 10006 Yes, Captain, how can we help you? I want to inform you about the leakage. Never hesitate to ask for help. Tank container. What we will do is contact our local correspondent in Rotterdam and we will ensure that a surveyor and a chemist are instructed to attend upon your vessel's arrival. My Marisato number. No is one knows one, everything four, about the carriage of cargo. One, and what is your ETA? There is some leakage. The more we share our experience, the better we can take care of business for the benefit of all.